chapter 11. Thank you, Father. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians eleven. Verses twenty three through twenty six. We'll talk to this passage. You we'll see our offering celebrates communion. And then we will hear some announcements and get you out of here. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to talk about our communion. Let's stand together, even if you don't have your Bible. Verses 23 through 26. Let's share it and read it. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus same night in which he was betrayed to the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do it remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. On your way down, give somebody a great big God bless you. I want to talk about two concrete reminders. From the text that is set before us, I want to talk about two concrete reminders. You'll notice in your text, in your reading time, as you read the Holy Letter chapter, Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth, you'll find that after verse 16, Paul moves there into a new topic. When you read the chapter in its entirety, you'll notice that after verse 16, it seems that he goes from one extreme to another. He goes from hair and dress directly to the Lord's Supper. This is probably the most sacred part of our relationship to God when we talk about communion. It is a very vital part of every born-again believer to have communion with God. Word of the Lord came through even this morning and God's calling us to a deeper communion with Him. It has to be more than what's on this table. It has to be more than what we do every first Sunday. Please underscore this, that this is probably, in my opinion, the most sacred part of our relationship to God. And I'm very confident that the Lord's Supper is something that is greatly misunderstood in many of our churches. As a result, listen to this, it is almost blasphemy the way it is observed in some places. You'll notice in the text a little later on in the reading that Paul is going to say here that God is going to judge us in the way that we observe the Lord's Supper. Actually, when you read the text on down in the scripture, you will find that among the Corinthians there was some that were sick. And he says some even sleep. They had died, literally died cause of the way that they observed the Lord's Supper. Notice the reason he points out is because they did not discern the body of the Lord 
or the body of Christ. And I had to stop and question the text by simply asking this question, if you and I today really observe the body of Christ. I'm not talking about the method. I'm not talking about the ritual itself. I'm not talking about the uniformity of those that are serving. I'm not talking about whether we put on gloves or not. I'm talking about do we really discern the body of Christ. I'm talking about the fact that we do it every first Sunday so everybody know in the spring if you are one of the ladies that's a leader that we go to white. If it's in the fall we go to black. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about whether everybody else take it and then the preachers come and the officers come and we've got a string of officers and a string of preachers standing across here. I'm not talking about the ritual or the method itself. I'm asking, do we really take the time to discern the body of Christ? It's a serious issue. It's a serious matter. It is one to be observed if God is judging us on this matter. Corinthian church tells us that he judged them. Paul says he judged them on the matter. And let me say to you that the reason we're talking about this this morning because I believe that the Lord's Supper is the highest expression and the holiest exercise of Christian worship. I believe that. I believe this becomes our highest expression and our most holy worship for every born again believer. When you look at the text and you study the text in your reading time, the whole entire 11th chapter, but especially when you get down around verse 23 and a few verses up above verse 23, in Corinth you will notice that it had dropped to a low secular level that they were practicing, almost practically, being blasphemed. It jarred me. I looked at the text over and over and over again, as many seconds as we have celebrated the Lord's Supper. And I've come to the conclusion that in looking at this text and looking at it very closely, Looking at it again and again, I've come to the conclusion that today hundreds of groups like ours are meeting across this city. Thousands across this state. Millions across this nation. And they call themselves church. Many folk that are gathering in meetings just like we are right now, called the church will be observing and are observing what we call the Lord's Supper. In many cases, these churches are filled with people who love God, filled with folk who worship the Lord, listen to this, in spirit and in truth. Many people who enjoy His presence, just like we've enjoyed it this morning. And I don't know about you, but I'm still enjoying His presence. You don't have to be shouting to enjoy His presence. We've done all of that. We don't have to be running to enjoy His presence. I'm enjoying His presence right now. You know why? Because He is speaking to us right now. I'm still enjoying His presence. And there are many, 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 many houses of worship today that are meeting just like we are, where people are enjoying the presence of the Lord. I don't even think God sees the denominational name on the building. Amen. I don't think he sees the title of the one who's delivering the message. I don't even think he sees the title of whatever they name their ministry or their house of worship. But here's what he does see. He sees the hearts of people who might disagree with us on a number of things, but love him just as much as we do. <laughs> Hallelujah. But then I have to come to the conclusion that there are that are nothing but a religious scale. They have a form of Christianity. They have a form of godliness. The form of Christianity may be seen at that house, but God is not there. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is not there. 
The refreshing of the Holy Spirit is not there. The power of God is not present to heal nor to save. As I said to the people this morning in the early service, they have a house, they have a shell, but they have no presence All right. of the Almighty God. Listen, it's a dead shell clinging to where it was when it died. have been stamped over the doors. I don't know about you, but I don't ever want to be anywhere without the presence of Almighty God. I don't want to get up on any morning that His presence does not encompass us. I don't want to go anywhere where His presence is not welcome. I don't want to be in any city or any town or any state or on any job or any building where His presence is not there.
preaches from the highest mountain that flows to the lowest valley. But I wonder if there are some folk here that believe what you say when you say there's power in the blood. I'm glad I'm blood bought. I'm blood washed. I'm, I'm covered by the blood. Hallelujah. I said I'm glad. Let y'all say I'm glad I'm covered by the blood. I have been identified 
with Christ that I have died to the old life of sin. Not perfect, but I've died to the old life of sin and am now risen, what? In Christ to a new life. Water baptism, then, my brothers and sisters, does not become an option. It is a command of the Lord. Even in the Great Commission, jot this down, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. Matthew 28, 19. Even in the Great Commission, here's what Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. What are you going to do? Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And what? Lo, I am with you always. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. My brothers and sisters, if we have not obeyed the Lord in water baptism, then we need to do it. Parents, if your children are born again and can understand its meaning, encourage them to do it. Speak to one of our ministers. Speak to one of our officers. Speak to somebody that is in a place of authority. And I will assure you that they will help you in the matter of following God's command by being baptized in water baptism. The other ordinance designed to keep the essence of Christianity before us continually is the Lord's Supper. Not a ritual. Not just something that we do every first Sunday. Not just a piece of cracker and some grape juice. It is designed. Somebody called it just a symbol. It is more than just a symbol. It is an ordinance that's designed to keep the essence of Christianity before us as we live our lives for Jesus Christ. It is very vital. It is very important. That's why you see on the front of that table, this do in remembrance of me. That's why you see it on your bulletin today. This do according to the Gospel of Luke, in remembrance of me. Amen? Amen. Y'all not forget it. Some refer to it as communion. Some call it the Eucharist. Some say the table of the Lord. And each one of these terms emphasizes an aspect of this ordinance. For the rest of our time today, the little time that we have together, Without keeping you too long, I want to talk about the Lord's Supper and how very important it is for us to observe it often, but also to observe it with a pure heart and with an understanding of what it is that we are really doing. Even if you allow your children to partake of communion, that's your parental right. But please, ma'am, please, sirs, explain to them what they're doing. Amen. I know some kids say, I don't want some of that. <laughs> and that's your parental right to share it with them, to share it even as a family. But please, ma'am, please, sirs, explain to them what they're really doing. Amen. It is not a time of fun. Nope. It is not a time of doing taste tests. But it is a time of communing mm -hmm. with the Lord. Yes. And our communion ought to be more than just every first Sunday. Mm -hmm. How many of you know he wants to commune with us on Monday? Mm -hmm. And Tuesday and yes. Wednesday and Thursday. Yes. Some people just don't wait for settings like this. There are some saints of God that commune every day. They have their cracker, they have their grape juice, and they commune every single day. But even if you don't have your cracker, and your great Jews, how many of you know that God is calling us to communion with Him? Amen. It's not about what we eat or about what we drink, it's about our fellowship with the Lord. Amen. That you can know Him in the fellowship of His suffering, but also know Him in the power of His resurrection. Amen. You 
wants to fellowship with us. Daily. And this ought not be the holiest time of our life is when we put on our white and come together on the first Sunday. I mean, this ought to just be a continuation of the celebration that we've had all month long. Am I right about it? This ought to be a continuation of the celebration that we've already had six days ahead of time. And on the seventh day, we come in on the first day of the week and celebrate with you. As a corporate body. We should have already communed with you this morning. Notice this. Notice this. Notice this. When you turn your Bibles, if you're still in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if not, please flip back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Notice Paul's letter here. Let's go back to verse number 23. And really, you can read all the way down to verse number 34 in your reading time. I won't do that now for the sake of time. But in your reading time, you may want to go back and read all the way from verse 23 all the way down to verse number 34. It'll bless you and do you real good because it gives you a whole account. I'll make this two part. I'll do the sum today. And if the Lord tarries, we'll come back on the first Sunday next month. If he better say it before then. Uh, we'll come back first Sunday next month and we'll talk about it again. I'll make this two parts, maybe possibly a three parts. But turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23. And let's look at it again and read it together. He says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And he says what? This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. Notice he didn't call it wine. Many of us say wine. He didn't call it wine. He called it the cup. Because his body now becomes the cup that howls the blood. Notice he didn't call it wine here. You don't see anywhere in the scripture right here where he mentions it as wine. He says the cup. His body. He talks about it earlier. And now he slips down to talk about the cup. Let's read it together. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye. As often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And he says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, there he goes again, you do show forth the Lord's death till he come. Verse 27, wherefore whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and what? The blood of the Lord. Now notice this with me. Notice this with me. Because these are full instructions. You can't miss it. Paul, through the Holy Spirit, has plainly pointed out and given us full instructions. Somebody just say, thank God for instruction. Thank God for instruction. This passage is power packed. It is full of instruction concerning communion. It is full of instructions of what communion is all about. Why we do it, how we are to do it, and what we must do and must not do to make it effective. Plain and written. I mean, all of the instructions that you need are right here. All we have to do is just read them. Amen? Amen. We don't have to focus on anybody and see how they do it so we'll know how to do it. It's plain as day right here. Aren't you glad about that? Amen. First, consider with me. Listen to this. Consider with me the requirement. I want to talk about the requirement. Notice in verse number 24. He says in verse number 24, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Which is what? Broken for you. And he said, do this, or this do in remembrance of me. Now, notice the requirement there. Notice these two words that he uses, do this. Two words that the Apostle Paul wrote in verse number 24. He says, do this. Somebody say that with me. Do this. Do this. Say it again. Do this. And one more time. You remember back over in the Gospel of St. Luke, when Jesus went to the wedding of Canaan one night, and
And the wine ran out. And they went to Jesus' mother in the book of John. Excuse me, in the book of John. And they went to Jesus' mother and said to Mary, the wine has run out. Check with your son and see what he can do. Ask Jesus if he can help us out here. And she goes to Jesus and begins to talk to him. And they figure that since this is his mother, then his mother ought to be able to entice him to do this. And Mary went and talked to Jesus for just a few minutes. And she came back and they said to her, what did he say? And she said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. They were probably a little bit confused. Probably asking themselves, well, what does she mean? What is he going to do? Listen, whatever he tells us to do, tell somebody to do it. See, God has so many ways of giving so many commands, and all we've got to do is follow the instruction of God. Where the Lord came through here this morning for folks to just praise God. And sometimes people don't understand that. We wouldn't even able to minister God's word this morning. The word of the Lord came through, and God was just saying, praise me. God was just saying to the people this morning, if you need healing, just receive it. See, sometimes God sends stuff like that just to see if we're going to be willing to open up and do that. Sometimes it's not another sermon that we need. It's not another key struck on the organ. We don't need to pull out another stop. We just need to do what God tells us to do. And sometimes when the pastor or the leader gets up and gives us instruction from God, Because you don't know how bad they did me. You don't know how bad they hurt 
speaking to his followers. But then apart from speaking to his followers, listen to this. He's speaking to you and I. He's speaking to us. While he was holding the bread in his hand. And saying, take, eat, do this. Let me say to you, for every believer, communion then is not an option. I see people many times set up in this church and in many churches that I've been to where communion is being served. And when communion is starting to be served, many people will throw their finger out by way of asking permission. And everybody's not going to work either. See, sometimes you have to shed your robe and take your collar off and 
And too many of us looking what folk gonna say about us and what they gonna think about us. And if I'm a preacher, I can't even stand in front of everybody else. I can't One, 